Okay, so a jellyfish, a sea anemone, and a coral walk into a bar. The bartender says, what can I get you? And none of them respond because they don't have brains and they're suffocating on dry land. <laughs> but they have something else in common too. They're all members of the phylum Cnidaria. This is a wildly diverse group of animals that are, at first glance, pretty simple. Their body consists of a mouth surrounded by tentacles. Each tentacle covered in stinging cells called cnidocytes. But among the animals in this phylum, that's where the similarities end. Some are solitary, some live in colonies, and some join their bodies together to function as one single creature. Some cnidarians drift hundreds of miles over their lifetime, while others spend their entire existence rooted to one spot. Most are harmless to humans, but a few carry some of the most toxic venom found in the animal kingdom. They're organisms with a life cycle that's so incredibly weird that they might as well be aliens, but they've existed on this planet for over 500 million years. But how weird are they exactly? What makes them so unique, and why should we care? We'll answer all these questions and more as we continue exploring the Tree of Life. The word cnidaria translates to nettle animal, and anyone who's ever been stung by a stinging nettle plant might understand why. The stinging cells used by cnidarians to defend themselves and capture prey are found nowhere else in the animal kingdom, and they're incredibly complex for their size. When an animal, be it plankton or human, triggers one of these cells, a microscopic harpoon fires out from a capsule within the cell and injects a cocktail of toxins that can cause minor irritation, severe burns, and even cardiac arrest depending on the species and the number of stings deployed. The harpoon firing from a cnidocyte cell is one of the fastest mechanisms in the natural world, accelerating with a force equal to 5 million Gs. That's five million times the normal force of gravity, literally faster than a speeding bullet. Makes a bee sting seem kind of lame, doesn't it? According to the World Register of Marine Species, the phylum Cnidaria can be broken down into five major classes. Anthozoa, the sea anemones and coral. Cyphozoa, the jellyfish. Stuarozoa, the stock jellyfish. Cubozoa, the box jellyfish. And Hydrozoa, the class including the infamous Portuguese man of war. From afar, these animals don't look all that similar. But when you take a closer look at any cnidarian, you'll notice one of two distinctive body forms, the polyp and the medusa. The polyp is sessile, meaning that it stays attached to one surface its entire life and doesn't normally move around too much. The polypoid body form is best exemplified by our dear friend, the sea anemone. The mouth of a polyp faces upward, surrounded by tentacles that retract into their bodies if they feel threatened. The medusa form is the classic jellyfish shape, swimming with their mouth facing downward, surrounded by tentacles that trail behind them as they drift in the ocean currents. At different parts of their life cycle, depending on the species, cnidarians will often switch between these two body forms, a process known as metagenesis. Buckle up everybody, this is where things get sciency. Let's use jellyfish as an example. A jelly starts its life as a precious little larva called a planula. A planula will float around in the water until it finds a suitable substrate to settle down into. Their bodies then change into the polyp form, which consumes plankton and other small organisms until it builds up enough energy to begin budding, basically cloning itself and forming a community of new polyps that are genetically identical to the original. They stay in polyp form until the next phase of their life cycle, which is usually brought on by seasonal temperature changes. This is when something really incredible happens. The polyps undergo a process called strobilation, in which the tip of each polyp forms a stack of tiny medusa, which detach themselves from the polyp one by one, grow into adult medusa, then reproduce sexually to create more planula, starting the cycle over again. So in a single jellyfish life cycle, it changes shape three times, reproduces sexually once, reproduces asexually a bunch of times, and then finally forms a baby jelly. Good thing it can't get more complicated than that, am I right? <laughs> the process that I just described for you is a very loose and general description of one class within Phylum Cnidaria. But each class adds their own special twist, 
Anemone, for example, never develop a medusa stage, instead growing into large, solitary polyps. Coral also skip the medusa stage, instead building big colonies of polyps supported by a shared skeleton. Jellyfish are very conspicuous in their medusa form, but teeny tiny in the polyp stage. Box jellies are also larger as medusa, but produce only one medusa per polyp, while true jellyfish can produce many. Stocked jellies form medusa that stay attached to the seafloor instead of drifting, and hydrozoans do all kinds of wacky stuff that we'll get into in another video. What all these groups have in common is that the ocean and our entire planet would be a very different place without them. While their stings can spell disaster for many organisms, cnidarians also provide an important food source for many others. Sea turtles, ocean sunfish, whale sharks, and some whales can consume large amounts of jellyfish without experiencing any negative side effects. Leatherback sea turtles in particular rely on jellyfish and hydrozoans as their primary food source. Being food for other animals is an important job, but it's far from their most impactful one. Cnidarians of the class Anthozoa are responsible for creating the most biodiverse marine habitats on Earth. Reefs. Coral reefs are tropical ecosystems built over centuries by colonies of soft-bodied polyps. The polyps take calcium carbonate from seawater and use it to build enormous limestone skeletons. These skeletons are also home to symbiotic algae that use sunlight to produce energy for the polyps during the day. In return, the polyps feed on plankton at night and provide the algae with excess nutrients. Together, they create interconnected structures that provide habitat for fish, crustaceans, worms, sponges, reptiles, mammals, tenophores, and of course, other cnidarians. Coral reefs make up less than 1% of the ocean floor, but they provide homes for an estimated 25% of all ocean species. Removing coral from a reef is like removing trees from a rainforest. It just doesn't work. And with so many species relying on healthy reefs for their survival, the food web inevitably connects them back to us. Commercially fished species like grouper and snapper depend on reefs for food and shelter. New sources of medicine, including cancer treatments, can be found in reef ecosystems. Over 330 million people especially indigenous and tribal communities, rely on reefs to sustain themselves and feed their families. And as climate change continues to increase the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, coral reefs create a natural buffer to protect coastal populations from storm surges. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, over half a billion people rely on reefs for food, income, and protection. So it's not hyperbole to say that coral reefs and the phylum Cnidaria as a whole are essential members of the animal kingdom. Next week, we're meeting a phylum that looks very different from everything we've covered so far. A group of animals that have hard shells, allowing for an extensive fossil record. Animals that have body symmetry, a complex nervous system, and the most impressive brains of any invertebrate. The mollusks, phylum mollusca. Until then, stay curious, stay connected, and never stop evolving.